this is the first time I've ever been to an IHOP event. Um, yeah, and uh, which is, it's kind of crazy to me because I didn't know that much. And, you know, so I kind of went on the internet and started looking things up and, and I go, man, there's a lot of great things going on here. And today was the first time I ever met Mike Bickle. The International House of Prayers leadership team told parishioners they're investigating founder Mike Bickle. And I love that guy. I do. I, I mean, you know, and Mike knows we've talked about this, you know, uh, there's people that told me not to <laughs> hang out with him. Like, you know, you know, words like creepy come up. After allegations of sexual immorality. I know you're human, believe it or not, you really are. <laughs> Furthermore, with the clarity of hindsight, there is now reason to believe that Mike used his platform, powers of persuasion, and employed legitimate biblical themes of forgiveness, overcoming accusation, David's life story, and more to essentially inoculate the staff and global audience into an unwitting position of suspicion regarding legitimate, truthful inquiry. They did release a statement saying in part here, when these allegations were brought to our attention, we were shocked. We could never have imagined that inappropriate conduct with women as something we would ever need to be concerned about. Worse still for the victims of instilling fear should they not release Mike from guilt or fail to affirm the narrative over his life. The sophistication of this messaging and prophetic manipulation are subtle, calculated, and shocking. They went on to say that these actions were out of character, but too serious to ignore. So we will continue to update you on this story as new developments become available. Pathological narcissism is clearly in view. And, and, and yet, I get to know this guy and I'm going, man, I love his heart. And I just want to publicly say I love Mike Bickle, you know? In this 2018 sermon at his church, Francis Chan makes no distinction between people gossiping and people confronting false teachers or false teachings. According to Chan, saying anything negative about another Christian is equivalent to taking a sledgehammer to the temple of God. That's why if someone is going to gossip to you and say something negative about someone else in the body, man, it is your job, if you love that person, to warn him. They do put that sledgehammer down. Are you insane? Do you know what's going to happen if you destroy God's temple? Do, are, you, are you an idiot? You're, you're seriously going to go after? That's why if you come from another church, man, don't go telling me anything about what happened over there and how they mistreated you and, oh, you poor victim. Man, I'm sorry, whatever. But you know what? Let's be very careful about our words. That's why people don't come to me with that stuff. You know, people boast like, oh, I'm a safe place. No, you're an enabler. You're an unloving enabler. Notice how Francis Chan repeats this idea at the One Thing Conference in 2018. Only this time, he claims it's a word from the Lord. Mike and I both got a word yesterday morning, we believe. And it was James 1, 19, that we should be quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to become angry. And I believe that word was for this generation and for us on this stage. But then I felt like a lot of the day, we were all like anxious to say something, you know, and there wasn't enough time for all of us to speak. And, and, and I know that when I came here and I heard about the structure of how we we're gonna do things here, my heart leapt because I imagined, wow, a conference where we're not planning out every second. Okay, at 4.01 and 39 seconds, you jump on stage, the lights come off, the fog machine comes on, and then you give a two-minute exhortation from God, you know, and, and you're just like panicked, like, okay, 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 and, oh shoot, you were five seconds late, you know, like, <laughs> you guys, that's the world's influence on us. That's watching Sports Center or whatever else, and everyone's clamoring, and we're supposed to be unstained from the world, where we are people who are quick to listen slow to speak, slow to become angry in a world where I know if I say one thing wrong, one word wrong, some of you are so quick to jump and respond. He's a false prophet. He's this. We're quick because we can. When I was growing up, I wasn't allowed to speak. But you guys, ever since you were born, you could speak to the whole world. And I believe we've been stained by the world.
Does this sound like a man who welcomes accountability to himself and to his famous friends? No, it's the opposite. Here's the message that you're going to hear over and over again in this video. In other news, sexual misconduct allegations have sidelined a prominent faith leader right here in Kansas City. The founder of International House of Prayer will not be teaching or preaching as these accusations are being investigated. Fox 4's Malik Jackson is live at Forerunner Church, which is associated with IHOP KC. And Malik, the church addressed these disturbing allegations during service today. I love Francis Chan! <laughs> I wanted to say that back. <laughs> They did, in fact, address these allegations against the founder of IHOP KC, Mike Bickle, today. And we do know that these accusations are coming from multiple women over a long period of time. You know, we did that episode on the Billion Soul Harvest. For wait, wait, say that again. The Billion Soul <laughs> Harvest. You're rubbing off on me. Mike Bickle is con <laughs> contagious. It happens. Right? Mike Tom Bickle. So, but for these these young leaders of revivals that that are rising up, how do you steward that well? And 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 how can we learn from you? So we want to talk about those things. Are you going to attack Mike Bickle? Are you going to attack some of these expressions in the body of Christ that may look a little? I'm just saying, dude, put that down. I've met these people and I see their hearts and, I, and, and I, I hang out with people from these different denominations. I'm like, man, they love Jesus. It looks different from me, but I can see the spirit in them. So you, you, we better be careful. Former leaders wrote a letter together saying the news shocked them and called the accusations credible. They say multiple women have come forward detailing years of abuse. It's reprehensible. It's it's a total betrayal. Well, first, uh, it is fun for me to be with Sam Storms. He is one of my dearest friends in the last 30 plus years and a brilliant theologian, but way better than that. He loves Jesus with intensity. I've watched him close for 30 years. So to be with him, with this theological depth, with this kindness and relationship to people, he's very, that's really the test of faith, the way you treat people in relationships, but his passion for Jesus. So I had to say that first, Sam, and I, it's a joy out to you, buddy. It's, it's a joy to be here. In case you're not familiar with Sam Storms, he is a respected theologian, author, and pastor who also happens to be a big supporter of Mike Bickle. In this 2019 article on his blog, he goes into detail about his relationship, both personal and professional, with Mike Bickle and the International House of Prayer, and then goes on to explain his thoughts about the movement. I just want to read his conclusion in the last few paragraphs of this blog post. In conclusion, my mind goes back a few weeks to that Friday morning as Anne and I sat in the prayer room in Kansas City. I looked around and said to myself, hmm, what's going on here? Well, I see the very young, the very old, and a lot of middle-aged folk praying, worshiping the Lord, and studying their Bibles. My, my, I said to myself, that's certainly subversive and spiritually unhealthy. We can't have that going on. Yes, I'm being sarcastic. In a time when so many are pursuing every manner of sexual immorality, lobbying for the rights to kill unborn babies, and fomenting racial hatred, couldn't we use a few more passionate people who love Jesus, believe and obey what's in their Bibles, and delight in extended seasons of praise? I think so. If you don't, go ahead and tear apart IHOP Kansas City and Mike Bickle. Launch your angry tirades. Pick them apart for the way they devote themselves to the glory of God and the proclamation of the gospel. In the meantime, as someone once said, I prefer the way they do it, even if it isn't perfect, to the way you don't do it. As you can see, Sam Storms has been a huge supporter and promoter of the International House of Prayer and Mike Bickle. He even went on Remnant Radio and did over a dozen episodes on various things relating to the International House of Prayer, Mike Bickle, and the so-called Kansas City Prophets. I made a couple of response videos to these videos, and uh, I'll play you an excerpt first from the one where Mike Bickle has made a number of claims about weather-related prophecies that supposedly came true. Wearing a winter coat, and it was about 70 degrees out. <laughs> the official weather report for that day, March 7th, 1983, high of 51, low of 34. It was about 70 degrees out. On March the 7th of 83, uh, went over to meet with him, Mike Bicklin. When he originally prophesied When he originally it. prophesied all this, and it, it was, was hot outside. And the temperature was in the 70s in Kansas City on the day we met. It was about 70 degrees out. <laughs> And in this video, I'm responding to a Remnant Radio video where Sam Storms retells all of the Mike Bickle stories about getting a dream that he's at a Benny Hinn meeting and then he finds himself at that very meeting in real life. And this is one of the things that helps him to establish the International House of Prayer. 
Here are a couple of the most problematic things that he says in that video. Maybe God is just telling all of us to dial it down a little bit. I mean, especially in this age of these so-called discernment bloggers. I mean, if you comb, if you part your hair on the wrong side, they're going to tell you you're going to hell. I mean, it's yeah, almost that bad. True. And they're vilifying godly people. Unfortunately, the, the so-called discernment bloggers are doing that very thing. They're, they're just crucifying the body of Christ, and it's, it's reprehensible. I've been ridiculed by several individuals when they heard me say, yes, Benny Hinn is a born-again man of God. Does he have a faulty theology and sometimes a manipulative ministry style? Yes, but the man loves Jesus. I'm convinced of that. Attention, Benny Hinn, you are cleared for takeoff. You're free to scam people and take as much money from little old ladies as you want. As long as you love Jesus, you're good to go. Here's one more video. I did this just a couple of months ago, and Mike Bickle is showing himself to either be one of the dumbest people on earth, or he's in on the gag with Chris Reed, who uses a smartphone or a, uh, a smart pad, and he's getting people's personal information and pretending it's prophecy. Petri, Petri. That's your last name? And Angie? Okay. So you probably know like Margaret and Tom and all them. Okay. <laughs> What's that? Let's say it again. They're watching. They're watching. And so are they on the phone too? <laughs> Do we need Mike to introduce himself? Okay, he oversees the International House of Prayer. I, I think we've got that. Yeah. Just, all of the blogs on the internet about him are completely true. So <laughs> go, just go, just go read any of them. Oh, just they, read any that's of your them. Introduction, and you'll get, that's your, you'll get your introduction. Your introduction yeah, like one guy was so excited, and we were meeting. He goes, "I just love it." He goes, "I want to, I wanted to hear all your stories." I'll go on the internet. I said, "Please don't." <laughs> the idea here is clear: people who say negative things on the internet are wrong because we say so. Listen to Francis Chan pound this message home. I, I just want to speak to, this isn't the IHOP, this is for other people who might be watching this, because I know some of you have ditched Mike, and some of you ditched him because of something you think you might have heard someone say that may or may not be true. How dare you? And so you're gonna ditch all of that, 50 years of prayer, teaching, you know, a, a lifestyle, and I thank God for a simple lifestyle. He could have made so much money and be living this lavish life, but he lived this way for all of those years. You're going to ditch all of that and all the ridiculous stories because you heard something from a friend. I would say you are so foolish. And also, you better be careful because the Spirit of God dwells inside of him and you so easily depart from a son of God. I just can't do that. On October 20th, just a little over a week before all of this very, very disturbing information became public, Mike Bickle gave a long hour and a half sermon where he's supposed to be talking about King David and the way that some of the Old Testament scripture passages apply to current events and the life of the church today. And if you listen to it, you will hear what appears to be a very amazing coincidence that he's talking about the need for people not to accuse each other within the church environment. In other words, there's going to be a bunch of difficult things coming, and if you're accused of doing something really, really bad, that means that you're in the right. And the one thing you've got to do is just not defend yourself and remain silent as you allow the Lord to be your defender. But I know we're getting closer and closer to things really escalating at a whole nother level. I said in January 2000, or February, I said the 2020s will be the most dramatic transitional decade in human history. Not, in, not just in the last hundred years, in human history. There will be more dramatic global change in the, in the 220s than any time in history. And just so you know, that wasn't like some great word about a thousand other people said it too. So I'm not trying to think, I prophesied. But it was really clear. 
And uh, we're at 223, 224, 225. It's going to be far more intense than the last three years. And I think the 2020s are only going to be surpassed by the 2030s. It, it's, it's game on. We're in a new era of human history leading up to the coming of the Lord. And that's why I love your hunger for this forerunner messaging and stuff. But anyway, let's go to David. Number one thing that David sticks out over and over and over is how David trusted God to vindicate and deliver him. When he got, now, when he, if he's fighting the Philistines, a military conflict, he trusted God, but he killed him. But when it's within the relationships, within the redeemed community, his natural family or spiritual family, I mean, all of Israel's in the redeemed community in that general sense, meaning they were, you know, that's their testimony. He didn't touch them. He treated them differently than the Philistines. He'd kill the Philistines, I mean, with incredible success. But internally, he goes, I can't do this. I, I got to do this God's way. And the passage I love, I quoted the most, it's 1 Samuel 24, 12. I've used it many, 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 many times. David says, like he's standing here before King Saul. And he had King Saul, most of you know, for seven years approximately, King Saul was chasing him, David. His son-in-law, David, King Saul's his father-in-law, because God anointed the kid to take over the kingship from the dad. And the dad didn't like this. He had 3,000 soldiers chasing David for seven years. There some reprieves in there, but... So David, through this situation, has Saul at the end of a sword. God set it up. David's in his 20s. Saul's in his 60s. David's got it. And Saul, like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, you could kill me. And David said... I won't touch you. I will let the Lord judge, or other translations, let the Lord decide. So what David did is he invoked the Lord's activity. Let the Lord avenge me on you. I'm not touching you with my mouth or with my hand. I won't do it. God's watching me. And when you know that God's watching you and you know he cares, you don't have to vindicate yourself. You have to vindicate yourself if you're not sure he's watching or you're not sure he cares. I'd like to read something that is not totally public. It may be a total fraud. It may be just a fluke that somebody made as a hoax. I think it's real. Initial statement of the investigation team. Much to our deep sorrow, we are compelled to report that Mike Bickle is completely unfit for leadership or influence at IHOPKC and should be stripped of all messaging and moral authority to the wider body of Christ. This report will demonstrate the veracity of these claims and is a clarion call for further investigation, immediate provisional action, and deep institutional reform. If further investigation bears out the findings of this report, even by half, Mike will not have proven to be a perplexing moral contradiction, but a confirmed sexual predator. For 30-plus years, it strongly appears that Mike has lived a double life, presenting himself publicly as a model Christian leader and disciple whose unrelenting call to holiness and full surrender to Jesus inspired millions around the globe to his message, all while secretly wooing and taking advantage of numerous women under his care, shattering his marriage vow in serial fashion. A number of Jane Doe's or their husbands have come forward sharing remarkably similar stories, language, and methodologies, all without prior coordination. Furthermore, with the clarity of hindsight, there is now reason to believe that Mike used his platform, powers of persuasion, and employed legitimate biblical themes of forgiveness, overcoming accusation, David's life story, and more to essentially inoculate the staff and global audience into an unwitting position of suspicion regarding legitimate, truthful inquiry. Worse still for the victims of instilling fear should they not release Mike from guilt or fail to affirm the narrative over his life. The sophistication of this messaging and prophetic manipulation are subtle, calculated, and shocking. While a formal diagnosis has not been made, pathological narcissism is clearly in view. Each person responsible for the development or presentation of this report has been a longtime ally and friend to Mike, either as spiritual peers, brothers, or sons. 
we weep and rejoice not to disclose the material in this report. Humbly aware of our own flaws, our motivation is fearful obedience to Jesus, sober obedience to the process outlined in Scripture, profound grief, and righteous anger on behalf of the alleged victims. This statement was signed by a number of IHOP leaders, but since it is not officially public yet, I will just leave it at that. And if it turns out that these horrible claims are not true, I will gladly take down this video. And in these two dreams, Psalm 55 is highlighted. In Psalm 55, you, you, some of you know it, verse 12. It's David saying, I'm betrayed not by a friend. I mean, not an enemy, but a familiar friend. We have sweet fellowship inside of the inner circle. And the Lord says, this is going to happen. But not, I'm not thinking of me. I'm thinking of the global body of Christ. This is going to start happening. Because it happened to David, and it happened to Jesus. And I'm thinking the global body, you know, I mean, I'm part of it, so yeah, me too, but I'm thinking the global body of Christ. This is David's most powerful secret weapon, that you don't use it every time somebody bothers you. You use it rarely. And when you call God in to decide, he's before Samuel, Saul. I mean, let God decide. If David's not walking sincere, this backfires on David because God's watching. You can't play around with this one. You better be walking with a sincere heart if you pull this one out. Because God never is, is manipulated or changed in his opinion. And you say, decide, as though this is one of that case, I will according to your own words, and you're the one in trouble. Matter of fact, you're both in trouble. So my point is you be careful with that one. Be very careful. But the Lord's, I feel like, has blessed me to use it in each of the times. So some years later, it turned out different without me putting my hand or my mouth. I never said a word. The Lord said, don't talk. I will defend you. And that's, that's one of the hardest things to do is not talk. For 40 years, he told me that 40 years ago. Three or four times, supernaturally. Don't talk. I will defend you. But my answer is good. That's not what's going on here. I want to establish a, a testimony with you, and I want you to know this is real. He didn't say all this, but... And 50 years from now, this is going to be necessary in the body of Christ. I didn't hear any of that. But now, 47 or 40 years later, because we moved to Kansas City 40 years ago, and that's when this happened. Two times in 1983, 82, and 83, the Lord spoke supernaturally. Don't answer anybody who comes, any uh, ad adversaries, accusations. I will defend you. Don't touch it. Don't get them back. Don't whisper again. Uh, uh, don't tell the truth about them. Nothing like that. Never, ever. And so I've watched it happen over the years, and... But now I know 40 years later, oh, this is going to be a critical part of the end-time church. Four major weapons, murder, sorcery, immorality, and theft. Those are his four primary weapons, but accusation actually trumps all of those as the primary tool of Satan. He will do those other four, but accusation is at the front of the line. And the reason why I shared this the other day, if you're in a military context and, 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 and you shoot an, the, the, the uh, enemy soldier on the other side, Kill him, well, you got one less soldier. You wound him, 10 of his men have to take care of him. You get rid of 10 soldiers. Don't say anything about them or about yourself that God's not saying. What is he seeing and saying? That's the word of your testimony. That is critical. That's a big subject. That's a, you know, a big, long one. I mean, I'm going to move on. The rage of Satan, he's an accuser. He will strike. He will strike Israel. He will strike the prayer movement that's a part of this. But this was a personal thing, too, because Michael stood right before me and said these things. I don't want to explain the whole thing right now. The prophetic is, as you know, I already have to tell you this, highly controversial. Uh, we've talked about the prophetic controversy that broke out in 1991 and all of the scenario um, that was involved there. But today, perhaps even more now, the critics, the cessationists who ridicule the prophetic and ridicule all things charismatic and your name comes up and they throw your name around. Here is the 800 pound Mike Bickle in the room. In this so-called prophetic movement, nobody saw this coming. There were lots of prophecies about all sorts of things that have either not come to pass or were so vague that they really don't have any meaning. Over many decades now, we've had all of these spirit-filled prophets who were hearing directly from God and getting very specific messages, and not one of them heard, hey, that guy Mike Bickle is trouble. He's sexually abusing women. Get rid of him. 
That never happened. I think it's very fair to ask, if this is the prophetic movement, what value is there in prophecy if the leader of the movement himself can hide inside of that movement undetected for decades while doing great damage to people's lives? This man, Alan Hood, was one of the primary leaders of the International House of Prayer going back to the very beginning. And I want to read you the statement that he put out on October 31st. As many are now aware, there are serious allegations of spiritual and sexual abuse concerning my spiritual father, Mike Bickle. I have been walking closely with one survivor and her husband. She is a dear sister who is precious to my wife, Rachel, myself, and our family. We are deeply broken for her. She and her family deserve our utmost care, trust, and discretion. I have also learned of corroborating allegations from other victims. This has broken my heart to an unimaginable level. Furthermore, I am dismayed that survivors of abuse and those who advocate for them are being labeled as betrayers. Such speech shames victims and is an egregious form of spiritual manipulation. He then goes on to give reasons why they should be finding a third party to work on this project instead of trying to do it internally. And from the news as of today, they have announced that that's exactly what they're doing. Here's what he says at the end. There is only one way forward, a renewed commitment to holiness and the fear of the Lord that demands honesty and accountability. The Apostle Peter warned us that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. May the Lord purify our hearts and give the church a season of self-reflection and repentance. Okay, after that interruption, let's finish with Sam Storms asking that question to Mike Bickle. And you're going to hear him repeat that idea of never defending himself. I know you're human, believe it or not. You really are. <laughs> and you see these things and you hear them. How do you respond? Because we see so much vitriolic interaction in Twitter and the internet and blogs and people reacting and responding, and you very rarely, if ever, defend yourself. When you hear the criticisms, how does it affect you and how do you respond and why have you chosen to respond the way you do? Well, four times, and I'm not going to tell you the four, in the early days, like 40 years ago back, even so there's that four times the Lord spoke to me in very direct ways through others as well, not to answer my critics. And that's when I didn't have any. I go, why are you, quote, emphasizing this? I don't have any critics that I know of. And I did not realize that I would have the next 40 years tons of critics. Hmm. So it's, I'm not trying to be a hero, but I, you said mostly I never answer. It's a mandate from heaven. I don't believe that's for everybody, just so you know, because every we don't all have the same assignment and journey. But in this journey, the Lord knew not answering was critical. That's not true of every person's journey. And so some say, I'll do what you did. I go, well, maybe, maybe it didn't work for you exactly. So I will only say what I'm committed to versus what I did or did not do. I'll just mm -hmm. say, I say, I'm committed to the Bible having the written word, having authority over any prophetic word. I'm committed to if a prophecy does not honor that, it's wrong. But I'm not going to talk about that one prophecy and did it or did it not. I won't because I found out if you chop off one head, 10 more heads grow back on that, on that snake. That's you right. cut that one. They, oh, he lied. He said that one. And the Lord, I didn't know all that back then. He sure. just said, don't answer. Just say what you're committed to. The guy says, like I've had, like I've lived a, a I'm not saying this in some big way because it was important to me. I've lived a very simple lifestyle, but I've heard on the internet, I got all these elaborate things and I never say I don't have them. I never, I'm, I just simply say I'm committed to a simple lifestyle. And they go, yeah, but they say this and this. I go, I'm not going to answer that ever. I answered it in an earlier episode. I will so only, you know. I, I appreciate you answering it, but I will only answer what I'm committed to. I'm not going to undo anything. I just let it go. And that's just something the Lord was adamant about me about. So I'm, I'm sticking with it. I know you said you do not lay that on everyone as an obligation, but I think everybody listening to this podcast needs to listen to that and seriously pray about how they are going to respond. So Mike Bickle says that he was told by God never to respond to accusations about himself. And then Sam Storm says, yeah, but I, I answered on your behalf. And then Sam Storm says to the audience, everybody should prayerfully consider doing exactly the thing that Mike Bickle is doing, which is to never respond to accusations. It's kind of a weird thing to be saying when you're on a show responding to accusations. But Mike Bickle has been saying this for many years, that he never responds to accusations, he never tries to defend himself, so all the people who have been blindly following him and notice that now he's not defending himself, he's gone quiet, they're thinking, well, of course Mike Bickle is innocent, of course this is an attack of the devil, and of course he's going to come out on top of things, I'm going to stand with him. And that's what they're saying. Just read the comments from a large number of IHOP people, and you'll see they don't really care about the possibility that a whole bunch of women have been abused. What they care about is their leader. They've been indoctrinated to think that way for a very long time. 
Let's take a look at the statement that brought this terrible issue to the public's attention on October 28th. And this was written by three former IHOP leaders. Paragraph 1. A few days ago, we made the leadership team of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City aware of serious allegations spanning several decades concerning its founder, Mike Bickle. Without going into details to protect the privacy of the victim's identities, we have found these allegations of clergy sexual abuse by Mike Bickle to be credible and long-standing. The credibility of these allegations is not based on any one experience or any one victim, but on the collective and corroborating testimony of the experiences of several victims. Now look at paragraph 2. Prior to meeting with the leadership team of IHOP, we attempted to bring the allegations and the testimony of one of the victims directly to Mike Bickle in the spirit of Matthew 18, 15 to 17. However, we were repeatedly rebuffed by Mike Bickle, and we were refused any sort of meeting. Instead, Mike used manipulating and intimidating tactics towards the victims to isolate them and discredit them. To avoid further wounding of victims, we met with several members of IHOP's executive leadership team. There, we shared testimonies of these victims of Mike's inappropriate words and actions. But remember, folks, Mike Bickle hears directly from God. And God tells him that you're special, Mike Bickle, and you can do pretty much whatever you want, and I'll protect you. Mike Bickle doesn't need to meet with people and try to defend himself. Remember, God will defend him. He doesn't have to speak for himself because God speaks directly for Mike Bickle. I've had people, good, bad, and ugly, uh, whatever, over the years. I am not letting that man's words into my conversation with God. But he says you're, and they said you're, but God doesn't say it. I love God. God loves me. Let's go forward. That's what I say. And not only does Mike Bickle have God in his corner, well, he's got Sam Storms and he's got Francis Chan, more mainstream, a little bit more acceptable evangelicals who are able to defend him vigorously. And I'm not saying that they're in on this whole abuse thing at all, but they haven't helped, that's for sure. And then this just happened on November 2nd. This is from a former IHOP leader. This morning, numerous former IHOP executive leaders and staff woke up to find all of their IHOP email accounts deleted. So much for a transparent, honest investigation. This is starting to look grossly like a cover-up. And Isaac, Isaac Bennett, he gave me a word. He said, the way these are connected, I really, I really appreciate this. He goes, you won't get in, you'll get in your chariot, whatever that means. That's symbolic. I don't even know what that means. But you'll never get into that sapphire sea of blue of the knowledge of God without the black horse attacking you. He said, any more than Joseph would never get into prison in Egypt and save Israel without his family betraying him. Well, this morning we're going to be sharing some sobering things. Undoubtedly, there are those that are tracking with some of the allegations, and we know that people are hurting and angry. And I just want to, for the sake of this meeting and this context, I want to ask that we just refrain in a spirit of love and humility out of those that are hurting and walking through various stages of this difficult conversation. This is a statement from the IPKC leadership team regarding allegations against Mike Bickle. We are heartbroken to share that we recently became aware of serious allegations of sexual immorality directed against Mike Bickle, the founder of IPKC. Our leadership team takes these allegations very seriously, and we are laboring for truth, light, redemption, and righteousness. We are engaging with outside parties to assess and arbitrate these allegations. Our priority is to love and serve the IPKC community during this moment. This news is unsettling for our spiritual family as well as our entire leadership team. Please pray for all involved, including the ones who have come forward, those who have experienced trauma, and for the Bickle family. We are asking for your patience as we work through this complex and very difficult situation. And secondly, we ask our spiritual family to refrain from using prophetic spiritual language that can be interpreted as dismissive of the pain of those who are traumatized. On October 26th, the IBKC executive leadership team asked Mike Bickle, and he agreed to not preach or teach from the IBKC platform. 
attend our 24-hour prayer room, or engage his social media channels while we work with others to assess this situation. Now, now IHOP was a stretch for me. I bet. Um, <laughs> I, and I didn't realize, you know, because we studied them. When I met Mike Bick, like, oh, I studied you in seminary, you know. And <laughs> Not in a good way. All of these questions. Mm. And he began to clarify things. I'm like, whoa. I was so scared because once I said yes and they put me on some flyer website, I got so much hate mail that I, I remember even asking John Piper, I go, man, what do you know about Mike Bickle? Like, I, I'm, I'm getting <laughs> so many people angry, you know, and, and kind of asking his permission almost. Like, he goes, Francis, if you're asking me if I'm mad at you because you're going to speak for Mike Bickle, no, I'm not. He goes, I, I, I tell you, he loves Jesus. and mm, I love John Piper. No, he goes, I... I don't know all of his theology, and he goes, I think we differ some on some eschatological things. He goes, but he loves Jesus. And uh, and that's exactly what I found in Mike. Oh, the man loves Jesus. So I guess that's kind of been my journey is not so much, uh, uh, you know, me studying and coming to new conclusions, but me meeting people from different streams and studying uh, by asking them questions and and uh, trying to understand their point of view a little bit better. Hmm. I believe God spoke to me where suddenly I'm, I don't know if it was, I don't remember if it was an audible voice or whatever, but it was new to me. And it was like saying, Francis, I know you are afraid of these people. Do not be afraid of these people. And it was something like, this is your family. And um, it, I'm just going, okay, okay. But I, I'm not believing it totally. You, you don't understand, like when you're ingrained in something your whole life and taught something for years and believing it for years, and then you're warned again. You don't just immediately, even though you think you're hearing a voice right then, it's new to you, it's peculiar to you. And, but it was this sense in which don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. This is your family. And, and as we got to know each other and it just became this beautiful time to where at the end, and I asked Mike, he's like, ask any question you have about anything you've ever heard about me. And I began asking and he began answering and explaining why he didn't spend his life defending himself. And God told him not to do that. And my jaw is just dropping at the humility of this man, the biblical knowledge of this man, the faithfulness for so many years that by the end of our time, I had to just publicly say, look, I don't care what you think. In the, and I'm speaking to the people that had been following me for years and had written me off now. I'm going, I love this man. And, and I, I just wanted to stand by him because I'm going, this, I, I misread him. Um, I was told the wrong things about him, and I see who he is now, and I'm going to stand with him. Uh, we have been made the recently aware of allegations involving Mike, and uh, our leadership team is taking the situation very seriously. We ask that we not make reference to the black horse in the situation as it is a dismissive of the pain of those affected. Our primary concern are those who are affected with pain and trauma, our spiritual family, uh, Mike and Diane, as well as the little family. And uh, let's connect, let's pastor and care for one another, ask all the questions, and we'll give you the answers that we can. And again, I'm appealing to be patient in the process, to let it unfold in its time as it can. Yeah, um, <clears throat> our hearts are uh, breaking in the midst of this, even in light of the allegations and all parties that are involved in those. And um, our primary concern is we're, we're after truth, we're after clarity, we're after a process in a godly and redemptive way, in a healing in a way that brings healing. 
we are after caring for the spiritual family that, that God has given to us here at IHOP KC. All those that are a part of our staff and teams and families and the broader Forerunner Church community. And so just to reiterate what Stuart and, and Dave also mentioned, that if you've experienced trauma, abuse, something of that nature, um, I want to encourage you not just to we have an email structure set up that you can that you can email us, but but go to a leader, go to a trusted person, go to a friend who would be an advocate for you if you've never disclosed those things, because we are firmly committed to this being a, a house and family of, of safety and, and holiness. And so please, please do that. We urge you to do that. Even at the end, when we wrap up this time uh, together, we're just going to have some of our leaders here at the front just to minister, to talk with you, to answer the questions that we can. Um, but we're not just going to rush out of the room. And so I've, I've talked and mentioned to, to some just to be here and linger and remain after this. I know how difficult these announcements can be. And so we just want you to know we're with you in the midst of this. And we really care about Jesus and we really care about all those that are affected by this news and so well with that I'm going to invite actually Brendan to come back out um, in terms of our statement for tonight in terms of our service that's kind of where we're at right now we're going to be ending the service a little bit early um, we're not going to be hosting EGS tonight I have uh, as you know I've been on the I do not consider this an acceptable level of transparency. In a room full of faithful witnesses, I'm being a faithful witness to my brothers. There is more to be shared, and what David just said is well-intended, righteous bullshit. I've told our students, they'll ask me, what do you think of Mike Bickle? I say he's one of the most important people alive. Are you going to attack Mike Bickle? Are you going to attack some of these expressions in the body of Christ that may look a little... I'm just saying, dude, put that down. I've met these people and I see their hearts and, I, and, and I, I hang out with people from these different denominations. I'm like, man, they love Jesus. It looks different from me, but I can see the Spirit in them. So we, we better be careful. Satan, most effective weapon, is accusation. Creepy.